It is a distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker this afternoon. Louis Jordan is the head of special collections at the University of Notre Dame, is the author of the splendid website on the coin collection there, which he has uh, put together with a great deal of information. He's also the author of one of the most important books on early American numismatics, John Hall and the Mint and Economics of the Massachusetts Mint. He has been publishing widely in, on colonial coins and currency, um, has written a number of important pieces for our publication, the Colonial Newsletter, and is collaborating currently with Philip Mossman on a new edition of Money of the American Colonies and Confederation. My pleasure to introduce Louis Jordan. Before beginning today, I would like to thank uh, the staff of the ANS and especially Oliver Hoover and Roger Saboni for organizing today's sessions. And also thank the Stack family for generously underwriting the conference costs. Although I am from Notre Dame, the home of the Fighting Irish, I shall not speak to you today about St. Patrick or the coppers that bear his name. Rather, my assigned topic is to discuss the coinage in the British colonies of North America up to the period when Mark Newby transported St. Patrick Coppers to West New Jersey in 1681. The early um, English New World settlements were private enterprises <clears throat> financed by either a proprietor or by a group of investors who had successfully obtained a charter to some land and who wanted to make a profit the investors financed an initial voyage to settle the land. The expedition typically included a few stockholders, some artisans, and laborers. All these settlers hoped to better their economic status, although some groups also had a religious agenda, like the Pilgrim Separatists in Plymouth and the Maryland Catholics. The colonists were expected to transform the wilderness into farms, fisheries, and fur trading posts that would yield a profit both for themselves and for the investors back in England. The preliminary years of colonization were always the most difficult. Popham Colony at Fort St. George in Maine did not survive the first year, while Jamestown, both settled in the same year, 1607, was almost completely decimated by starvation and disease. Um, I'm not sure where to point this. Ah, there we go. All right. Um, the Summer Island hog money is the first uh, group that I'll talk about. A rather unusual set of circumstances occurred in Bermuda during the preliminary settlement. The land survey of the island was delayed for several years. Basically, the surveyor left Bermuda. Oh, I want, I want two? Oh, it's really sensitive. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, but basically, the um, surveyor left, and they had to try to bring him back to Bermuda. He went back to England because he had um, conflicts with the governor. Uh, but this uh, incident meant that individual farm plots could not be assigned as quickly as was the case in other plantations. Therefore, a large portion of the population remained at St. George's Town, the port of arrival, much longer than anticipated. During this waiting period, the company offered to supply provisions and clothing to settlers, along with some payment, in return for work on municipal projects and company ventures. Therefore, the investors in England produced brass tokens for use in the colony adapting them on the model of the farm tokens used throughout the English countryside. When a new governor, Daniel Tucker, was appointed in 1616, the token coinage was sent to the island from England. This was the Summer Island hog money shilling, sixpence and threepence. These tokens had no value in international trade. They were simply a local expedient to be used to pay workers and could be redeemed at face value for merchandise at the company store. Once the land survey was completed in 1619, 
The individual farm boundaries were plotted. Then the colonists immediately settled on their land and planted tobacco, which quickly replaced hog money as the standard of exchange. <clears throat> I'll now turn to talk about uh, coinage in the British colonies of um, mainland North America to the year 1640. Most of these coins I'll be discussing have been found in um, an archaeological context that dates them to roughly before 1650. Um, I'm using the 1640 date because we can't precisely date things in archaeological terms. During the early decades of the 1620s through the 1640s, several plantations actually had some coinage available for local trade, although contemporary sources typically state that mo the money supply was minimal. Monies that have been recovered in an early colonial archaeological context are primarily smaller denomination coins and indicate that at least half of the available coinage was English, with a number of foreign coins added to the mix, sometimes rather exotic items. However, it should be noted that some of these foreign items, such as the Nuremberg Jettons, which I've already put up, um, freely circulated in England at this time. In England, for over a century, from say 1553 till about 1672, small change at a farthing value was not supplied by the crown, but was primarily issued by merchants or was privately produced under a royal patent. Indeed, even silver halfpence were rarely minted. The smaller denominations, particularly the farthing, were locally produced in lead and later in copper at weights that had a far lower intrinsic value than face value. Englishmen regularly accepted and traded greatly overvalued tokens as their small change, and we found out earlier today that was also true in Ireland. Typically, the value of a token rested on the willingness of the receiver to accept it at face value. If the issuer died or went bankrupt, the token might no longer be accepted and thus the holder would sustain a loss. In many ways, the mix of small change coinage in early colonial America would not seem overly odd to a contemporary Englishman. So first I'll talk now about coppers and tokens and, and just categorize them. First, are, um, the jettons. It seems copper jettons and tokens were used for a variety of purposes in the New World, sometimes as small change, possibly also as counters, and as Indian trade items. At the short-lived colony of Roanoke in North Carolina, dating to 1585, three Hans Schultz Nuremberg Jettons have been recovered, and that's like this one up here. Uh, most of, almost all the examples I'll show are not recovered examples, but are just examples of those particular varieties of coins, but not the actual um, archaeological uh, coins. Um, Nuremberg Jettons have been recovered um, uh, uh, at North Carolina, and one example is Hold. Was, it, it was found at North Carolina at Roanoke was Hold, suggesting that it was suspended, probably on a necklace. An identical jetton was found at an Indian site 40 miles away at Buxton near Cape Hatteras. In Jamestown at James Fort, which was erected in 1607 but abandoned in 1624, therefore we have a tight dating, over 90 jettons have been recovered. Many of the orb and cross jetton varieties of Hans Crowwinkle II, and that's is the second um, example I have down here. Crowwinkle Jettons have been found in archaeological excavations as far north as Ferryland, Newfoundland. One pierced specimen was recovered at the trading post in Pemaquid, Maine, uh, from an earlier period than what Phil mentioned, but at that same, in that same location. Uh, in addition to these Nuremberg tokens, uh, English tokens were also found. At Jamestown, a variety of English tokens have been recovered. 
in addition to a lead memorial token issued at the death of Elizabeth I, which I don't have an example of here, um, five examples of a copper token displaying an intertwined rose and thistle with a crown above have been unearthed. And that's uh, this particular coin. This copper has been identified as a James I touch piece and was handed out at royal ceremonies. A necklace containing 18 whole specimens of this same token was recovered from an early colonial era Indian burial site about 150 miles up the Potomac River from James Jamestown at Piscataway Creek, Maryland. And this, this is the actual uh, grouping that was recovered from that archeological site. Um, another variety then, at Jamestown and at several other settlements, there is evidence of the use of patent farthings. They have also been found at St. Mary's City in Maryland, at Plymouth Plantation in Massachusetts, and at a main trading post. We also find English coppers produced for circulation in Ireland, as we heard in the first, first talk this morning, specifically at, James, um, in, at Fort James in Jamestown, six Irish copper pennies and one half penny from the reign of Queen Elizabeth had been recovered. And that's, these are exactly the coins here. And, uh, in this very context, it has already been mentioned this morning. Now, throughout the northern settlements, we find the French double tournois has been recovered in some quantity, and several, I'm talking 10 and 15, a, a number of examples. This coin has been found at the English settlement in Ferryland, Newfoundland, as well as at Quebec City and at the French trading posts along the main coast. It is interesting to note that the double tournois also circulated in Scotland. Again, we heard these, this, this this morning. Under King James VI, James I of England, um, this foreign copper was replaced by the turner. And we have an example of a turner down here, which took its name and its original design from the tournois. A Scottish turner has been unearthed at Governor's Land, which is named the Main, in Jamestown, Virginia. Among other copper recoveries from the initial decades of colonization are two eight Merovides and one four Merovides copper from Spain. This is an example of the eight Merovides copper that were found in Fairyland. This is again up in Newfoundland. Um, along with some Portuguese coppers that were found in Newfoundland. Also, a Swedish copper dollar of 1639 has been unearthed at Fort Latour in New Brunswick. At St. Mary's City in Maryland, the most unusual recovery to date is a Venetian copper for Del minted for Dalmatia and Albania, uh, and it was minted at Zara. However, this is topped by what might be the most exotic copper find from the early colonial period. At the French trading post at the mouth of the Penobscot River, archeologists unearth a copper coin called a dam that was minted at the port city of Surat in India. And this is an example of that very coin, not that coin, but an example of that variety. And um, uh, Surat had been under Portuguese control and then in 1612 became the headquarters for the British East India Company. And so there was clearly a trade connection there, but it ended up at this French trading post in Maine. Finally, uh, among early tokens, I must mention the latest addition to the colonial family, the lead DK token, the first, um, which were the first coins, and this is a, the tokens because it's a group now, we know it's more than one denomination. Uh, these are the first coins produced in the British colonies of North America. Dating to the 1640s, they were privately minted in various denominations by David Kirk for, lo for local use in Newfoundland at Ferryland. Now I'm gonna move down to foreign silver. The, basically, these were just the coppers and tokens. There is little recovered foreign silver that can be dated to a pre-1650 archaeological context. For the most part, the finds are small denomination coins, 
with only one documented eight reales, and that item was recovered up in Newfoundland. Certainly, some eight reales were available in the southern colonies. Governor Butler's contemporary account of the Summer Islands plantation relates that in 1615, some Spanish dollars and Portuguese cruzados were discovered in the wreck of a Flemish boat. However, unfortunately for us, it appears eight reales were rarely misplaced or lost by early English colonists. Uh, the Fort James excavations at Jamestown have uncovered a German seshling from Lubeck. And I think that's what I have up top here. And a Dutch two stivers from Zealand. And I think this is a Zealand Dutch two stivers. In Farallon, the only, only a few foreign silver coins have been unearthed, and these items reflect the colony's partners and destinations in the fishing trade. The recovered coins include a French Duzan, and Billon, but it's close to silver, a Dutch Stiver, um, a Spanish half real from Ferdinand and Isabella, and the Spanish-American eight reales cob that I just mentioned. Small denomination English silver from the reigns of Elizabeth James in the first part of the reign of Charles up to the outbreak of the Civil War circulated throughout the American plantations during the early decades of colonization. These items account for over one half of the silver coinage finds at Ferryland, dating to the period before 1650, and seem to have been the predominant coinage in Massachusetts Bay until 1640. Uh, and here I'm showing you just some Elizabethan, um, Elizabeth coins, I think is a shilling, a six pence, and a, um, a, a one penny. Uh, English silver has even been associated with the early settlement at Roanoke. Much of the recovered English silver from the southern colonies appears to have been cut for use as small change. At James Ford, early coin recoveries include a one-eighth wedge of an Elizabethan shilling at one, one point, one and a half pence, an Elizabethan half groat, half to one pence, and a three half pence, half to three farthings, along with a James the first penny. However, in the northern colonies, several uncut specimens of English coinage have been unearthed. At the Richmond Island trading post off the coast of Portland, Maine, Several English silver coins from the reigns of Elizabeth, James, and Charles were recovered. And I'm showing you some James um, the first coins, uh, 12, six, and one penny here. Uh, again, all denominations that have been recovered. Uh, and at um, Richmond Island, the recoveries include nine shillings and 18 sixpence. And the hoard at Richmond Island also includes 15 English gold laurels from the reigns of James and Charles. Although no gold has been recovered from Jamestown, archeologists have uncovered weights for the Elizabethan real, as well as weights for the Unite double crown and angel of James I. At Ferryland, English coin recoveries include some Elizabethan three pence, a groat and Elizabethan sixpence, and from the reign of James I, a penny and a quarter, uh, laurel cut down to one shilling, as well as an Irish sixpence and an Irish shilling. And from Charles I, two shillings and a Scottish 20, 20 pence, which um, based on the rate of exchange would be one point, one and a half pence sterling. Uh, and this is the Scottish 20D, and then we just have a shilling and sixpence from uh, Charles I. In the Boston area, there are very few pre-1650 archaeological sites. In fact, there are only two. And neither of these sites have yielded any silver coinage. However, many records and probate inventories from Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth Colony mention sums of values in ready money or silver. These are inventories when someone died of everything that was in the house or that was in their estate at the time. Uh, and because they mention money or uh, ready money or silver, we know coins were available. But some inventories are more detailed than others, 
and suggests the available silver was English silver. The 1633 probate inventory for Richard Lackford of Plymouth lists among his possessions was a box containing three shilling coins. The last will and testament of Francis Lightfoot of Lynn from 1646 mentions that he had paid James Axe 19 groats and 11 pence. And the probate inventory of John Whittingham of Ipswich from 1650 states that he had a hoard of 25 shilling coins. With the secession of the Great Migration in 1640, the importation of English silver to the New World dramatically decreased. And overnight, this happened within a few months, soon as the Long Parliament um, went into session. Basically, Puritans stopped moving to the New World because they had control of Parliament now and stayed in England. Um, due to time constraints, I must forego a discussion of how Spanish-American carbs replace the, deleted, the depleted English silver supply and the role that these crude carbs played in the establishment of the mint in Massachusetts Bay in 1652. Since the topic of this conference relates to coppers, I shall turn to the question of small change in the period after 1640. So what I've been talking about is the small change tokens and then the silver up to 1640. Now I'm going to go to um, after 1640. It should be noted that during the entire colonial era, coins were only part of the economic mix. They helped facilitate exchange in economies that heavily depended on barter and the use of money substitutes such as beaver, wampum, corn, and tobacco. The imported patent farthings, the double turnoirs, and the DK tokens previously mentioned were never available in large enough quantities to become a significant and widely used small change medium throughout the British colonies. By the mid-1630s, several northern and middle Atlantic colonies were engaged in the beaver trade, exchanging manufactured goods like cloth and tools to the Indians in return for furs. Wampum was an essential element in this trade. Indians wanted wampum as well as manufactured goods, so every successful fur trader needed to acquire a supply of these wampum beads. Therefore, local merchants typically had little problem selling quantities of wampum to the fur traders. As long as the fur trade was profitable, wampum was a fungible commodity with some intrinsic value. For this reason, when no small change coins were available, merchants were willing to accept wampum in payments, and wampum soon became the most prevalent small change money substitute. We know, and that was some wampum beads, obviously. Um, uh, we know wampum was being used as small change in Massachusetts Bay even before the first legislation was enacted to regulate its value. From the Essex County probate records, we learn that at her death in 1636, Sarah Dillingham of Ipswich had one pound, two shillings, two pence in coins in her purse, along with four pence in wampum. She also had an additional three pounds, 17 shillings, 11 pence in coins stashed in two small boxes and another box with just over 10 pence in wampum. In this case, money clearly refers to coinage because all commodity money, such as corn and cattle, along with all, her other, all, all the other possessions, were individually listed in the inventory and assigned monetary values. The Dillingham Estate contains an unusually detailed probate inventory, but unfortunately, the individuals making this inventory were not numismatists and did not identify the specific coins or distinguish between blue and white wampum beads. We never have enough information, no matter how much they give us, we need more. It is likely a portion of this money, if not the majority, was probably in English coinage. Further, it appears that half pence and patent farthings were not present, since none of the amounts ended in fractions of a penny. 
Indeed, it is possible a smallish silver coin uh, was the 2D half groat. Again, this is simply speculation. It is especially interesting to discover that in her purse, Mrs. Dillingham was carrying over 22 shillings value in coins and just 4D, a four pence worth of wampum. Clearly the wampum was to be used as small change and only a small change. It was not until November of the following year, 1730, uh, 1637, that the general court first decreed wampum should pass at six beads per penny for any sum under 12 pence. During the depression of 1640, English silver was depleted and for a short time, commodities and especially corn and wampum became more prominent in local exchange. In June, 1641, Wampum was to pass current for sums up to 10 pounds. But in October of 1643, as Spanish-American silver was entering the renewed Massachusetts Bay economy, the wampum limit was lowered to two pounds. By the end of the decade, wampum was passing out of favor. In 1649, it was ordered that wampum could no longer be used to pay taxes, but it continued to be permitted in private exchanges uh, in sums up to two pounds. After the Hull Mint opened in 1652, the public was not amenable to accepting wampum from merchants and change, especially if they had paid using silver. For instance, in May of 1657, the House of Deputies answered a petition from the Charlestown Ferryman by ruling that passengers could not refuse to accept change of a penny or two in wampum since the lowest denomination coin minted was the three pence, and this is exactly what the document states. It seems ferry customers were paid, um, who paid for their passage with Massachusetts Bay silver wanted only coins in their change, not wampum. Indeed, it appears that with the exception of ferry rides, wampum was rarely used as small change in Massachusetts Bay by the late 1650s. Even in the farming communities of Essex County, uh, wampum no longer appears as a small change money substitute in probate inventories after 1657, and I've read through all the probate inventories to find that out. In May of 1661, Massachusetts Bay demonetized wampum. The following year, the general court authorized the minting of the two pence. Thus, one could now make a penny purchase by using a three pence and receiving a two pence coin in change. And this is the th a three and two pence New England coinage. Wampum passed out of use in Boston, but remained viable in outlying areas, such as the fur trading outpost of Springfield. Wampum also continued to be used in New York, and heavily uh, in New York, and in Connecticut with the last recorded instance of wampum as a small change money substitute dating to 1704 when Sarah Knight mentioned its use at a general store in New Haven, Connecticut. The period from 1660 until Queen Anne's proclamation of 1704, covering the history of the advancement and crying up of Spanish American silver is a lengthy episode that is well beyond the scope of this talk. Suffice it to say that by, 16, by the 1660s, some Spanish-American silver was circulating in most of the British colonies, even in the tobacco colonies of Bermuda, Virginia, and to a lesser extent in Maryland. Su um, supplemented during the last quarter of the century in the Middle Atlantic region by an influx of lion dollars. As silver coinage became more prevalent during the ensuing decades, we find the colonies addressing the problem of the lack of small change to be used in conjunction with the silver, the Spanish American, and the lion dollars. Just as Massachusetts Bay had demonetized wampum in 1661 and replaced it with the two pence in 1662, other areas were looking for small change coins to use alongside Spanish American silver. At a previous COAC, John Kleberg discussed the New York and America token of circa 1670 in relation to the need for small change and further explained the use of Commonwealth era English merchant tokens at that time. Merchant tokens have been found in locations as diverse as the Hamptons on Long Island, 
Gloucester City in West New Jersey, and Jamestown, Virginia. These tokens were probably brought over to America after Charles II demonetized them in England in 1672. Another demonetized coinage that made its way to America in 1681 is the topic of this conference, the St. Patrick Coppers. A year later, some Quakers brought 300 pounds worth of half pence and farthings to Philadelphia on the unicorn. During this period, the colonial economies were growing. More settlers were arriving and new cities were being established. In the middle Atlantic region, New York had been acquired from the Dutch the first Quaker settlers arrived at Philadelphia, and the first significant town was being built in Maryland at Annapolis, which soon became the capital of the province. Throughout this era and over the next century, there were continual challenges to increasing the money supply. The ingenuity of the colonists in adapting to these challenges and the diversity of their evolving responses is what makes colonial numismatics such a fascinating complex and rewarding field of study. Thank you. Yeah. You knew one area mm -hmm. uh, you didn't really address. Mm -hmm. One area that you didn't really address, I'm wondering if you, right. you might have information on is the Netherlands jetons uh, mm -hmm. used in New Amsterdam. Right. Uh, have you run across references to um, any of these? Yeah, in fact, I have. Um, and uh, they weren't just used in New Amsterdam. They've been found elsewhere as well. Um, uh, I should say that uh, I, this um, it's started at about 50 pages. I distilled it to 24 pages for the publication and then down to 300 words for this. So I actually left large chunks out, in fact, huge sections out. But in fact, uh, the jetons that I mentioned are not the only ones. In fact, there are French jetons. There are, there are several. But as it, um, I just gave examples of a couple that were fairly common. Um, but several other jetons, in fact, used. there was no questions that jetons in the early period were very common and had an influence in the Indian trade as well. Uh, but, but there were several other varieties. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So. I, I was curious. You didn't mention Lord Baltimore coinage. Right. I wondered if you'd seen any any circulation patterns for Lord Baltimore outside of the immediate Annapolis area. Um, well, that would have actually that would be in the St. Mary's area rather than Annapolis because it was earlier. Um, but no, I didn't um, uh, talk about that, or I didn't talk about Massachusetts silver. Um, basically, after 1640, because of the length, I just cut out the silver part, which is in the printed one, but I, and then just went to the other. But um, there, there is not, uh, to my knowledge, any widespread circulation of um, Lord Baltimore silver um, outside of the um, uh, province. Uh, and even within that, it's a very quick, uh, my, um, w what I've suggested in, in articles and is that uh, at the time that it was distributed and returned for, uh, people got so much Baltimore silver in return mm -hmm. and they had to give over tobacco that um, the, the price of it was such that it was um, to their advantage to use it to pay their taxes because they could get more that way than, in fact, by using tobacco. And so we find it very quickly went back to England in very high grades. So you find a lot of extra, very fine, extra fine examples uh, in England that it's, it seemed to be returned to Lord Baltimore, who in fact lived in London uh, and went back fairly quickly. And in fact, um, it has not even been found in archeological sites in Maryland, although the denarius has been found in archaeological sites. Denarius? Yes. Yes. And in Maryland? And, 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 and yes. And not the right. six or the That's right. Or the, or the, oh. or the four oh. pence, right. That's where, right. Where, where, where is that find? Hmm? Where is that find now? Where is that find? Yeah. Do you know where it is? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't. I can't. Okay. okay, I can't. I can't say. Right, but but it it it, it has. Right. 
Yes. Um, several. No, the more than one. More than one. More than one. More than three. <laughs> you won't tell us where they are? I would love to. <laughs> I have to talk to somebody. And I'm finishing a book on this, and, and I'm talking to someone, and I think they'll let me use that but, um, in the book. But, but it's, it, it, it's, um, that's all I can say. I mean, yeah. But, but, they have, but it has been found in archaeological context. It's Saint, in St. Mary's City. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, more? No, there's several. There's more than that. No, and there's a few. I mean, if you go to the Smithsonian, you'll see two or three. Yeah. Right. The Smithsonian's got a couple. There's a couple that are on the market. Uh, you know, there's a couple, there's a, um, uh, there was a, and um, uh, there, there are two that I think are known to be in private hands. And then there's the Smithsonian, there's the ones at British Museum, and there's this grouping. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm hmm So these other three are in private hands? Um, I can't, I can't, I just. <laughs> 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 other, other, other than on the denarius, any question? <laughs> no. But uh, it's just, this is really a lot of this information I just dug out of uh, archaeological reports. There are many, many archaeological reports that one can get at, and, and there's actually lots of examples of these you, things. You kind of refer to a 50 page article that you cut down to three, 300 words. Yeah. What is the 50 page article? Is that published? No, that's what I mean. Th that's going to be the the, yeah, the printed be form. Well, well, the third, the, the twenty-seven page version of that will be well, this. The no, no, that's in the book. But but the fifty-page thing is going partly will be some C four out. Just that it's too long. Um, when I started writing this, it got longer and longer, and I realized that this is one contribution to a volume rather than a volume in itself. <laughs> and so Olive has seen a lot of this, and we've gone back and forth. But um, you know, but but really, it, I would say most of this, all this, most all of this information is available if you just go through archaeological reports. Um, it's just a matter of the grunt work and time of going through page after page and index after index of all these and trying to find out, oh, they found this coin. Now, is it in a context of pre-1650? Do we know? Is it just no context or what? And, you know, and then trying to distill some information from that. That's basically what it is. But, but it is clear that up to 1640, there was clearly a lot of English silver. It's going to buzz, but it's clear that there was a lot, a lot more English silver available and in use uh, than people realize, and that it wasn't until you know a second step that they didn't come off the boat and start using wampum and um, cobs. It just didn't happen that way. That it was uh, uh, um, over a period of time that that that, that occurred, and then it, for, for economic reasons that stopped and changed and transformed in different places at different times. But um, just a lead into um, the St. Pat's. Okay. Thank. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was interested in what you were saying about the uh, the demonetization of the the wampum in 1661. Yeah. Because wampum still appears in the war accounts of yes. John Hull. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that Absolutely. that would be it being used just as a commodity then? Right, exactly. Because it continued to be used um, by fur traders. So what happened was it was sold, it was, it was bought and sold as a commodity just as you might buy anything else. Uh, you tried to sell it, but it was in fact as a commodity and Hull used it that way. If he needed some furs or wanted something from Springfield or for other people, he would then use that. He could not, after 1661, take it and force some merchant to accept two pennies worth of wampum uh, after that period. Uh, you could refuse it. So how, how is he valuing it then? Because he, he'll say, you know, wampum, Right. And then he'll give a, a, val a value exactly. to it. Exactly. So. Because, because you know how much you can get for a beaver fur on the market. 
but if it has a specific value, could be nine shillings, 18 shillings, yeah. depending if it's winter fur or summer yeah. fur. And then you would know how much wampum it could be, um, you know, 10,000 beads or 5,000 beads, uh, a, an individual would trade for a, a fur. And so because of that, you had a monetary value. And as long as it had a monetary valuable value, it could be traded uh, just like you, you, you might take um, uh, a thousand widgets or something else and send them off. And, and Hull did this all the time, all the time. He would take uh, molasses, he would take sugar, yeah. he would take everything. And wampum was just another item. It was, it was simply used as an item. And as long as there was a beaver trade where there was people in the area that you could sell it to, it had a value. If there was no one using it for the beaver trade, the value was nothing. There was no one to trade it to. And so as the beaver trade moved further and further west, it became more difficult to trade. So it was no longer for local merchants because it wasn't in Merrimack anymore. It was way out. And, but for merchants, it was still a valuable commodity. And Hull used it in that way. Yeah. So that's why it still has, and it still has an exact value. Absolutely. But in, in the beaver trade, when they're dealing with the, the Indians, Mm -hmm. Did the Indians require, you know, counting out the, the beads? Because my understanding was that, you know, in an Indian context, wampum has ritual value. It's, right. It's symbolic. It's, it's, it's it not, has it's nothing not to do. Right. It has yeah. no, the, the actual trade with the Indians differs depending on where it is. But um, uh, early accounts from New York uh, say it, uh, it would start out in Albany with First, you'd give them some liquor and get them going, and then you would yeah. present them with some wampum, kind of not as part of the deal, but to, as part of the ritual. Part of, of the ritual to yes. get to get yeah. things, and then you would give them so many hoes or knives or yeah, whatever yeah. it was for whatever kind of. And, and so it was all part of that. And the trader knew what he could get for these furs when he sold them to merchants or factors in um, the cities, and so. He had in mind what his costs were for the hose, for the wampum, for everything. And as long as he could sell it so that he could get a positive return, he would make money on this. If you were a poor trader, you would lose money. So if you were a, if you were a poor trader, you would lose money. So you had to keep in your head what the value would be and what the value of these other products might be. But the Indians didn't think that way. No. They just tried to get more and more wampum. Uh, the value is only in the, the viewpoint of the Western trader who's getting yes. that uh, and how he would make money and what he has to give out. So it has a monetary value, but only on one side. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>